Hey guys, Stefan Fischer here from All Off Road. Thank you very much for joining me today. In today's video I'd like to share with you my seven years of sand driving experience. That includes many desert trips, but also trips to Fraser Island, Morton Island and to many Australian and Tasmanian beaches. I'm also an accredited driver, trainer and assessor and have worked for quite a few four-wheel drive clubs as well as for commercial operators delivering four-wheel drive driver training and sand driver training. I reckon if you are new to sand driving and you follow my tips, you really should never need a recovery anywhere on the beach or in the desert. Part one of the video covers a lot of subjects, so I created an index in the video description. So feel free to jump between the different subjects and just click on the link within the index. One thing before we start. My YouTube channel is completely self-funded and it takes considerable time and effort to create these videos for you. So please help me to grow and continue making these for you by sharing, liking and if you can afford it, please head over to Patreon and become one of my Patreon supporters. With the equivalent of a cup of coffee or maybe even a few cups of coffee per month, you can really help me to remain independent and create these videos for you. If you are already one of my Patreon supporters, thank you very much. You're really helping me out making these videos. So let's get into it. Do I need a heavily modified vehicle for beach and desert driving? No, definitely not. But I would recommend a suspension setup which suits the weight you will carry and at least a two inch lift to give you a better approach, ramp over and departure angle. Here are some good examples on Fraser why our vehicles are set up, how they are set up. If we both wouldn't have had 35s and the big lift uh, crossing of the log wouldn't have been that easy and these water crossings here were also fairly deep. So with our height and tire size that really is no issue. However, if you have uh, small tires, if you don't have a lift, you really have to walk that and have to make sure that that is not too deep for you. For desert driving, I would definitely recommend some good suspension and at least a two inch lift. Um, because to get to the desert you will definitely have some corrugation and in the desert if you take the French line or any of the standard lines you will also have corrugation. So good suspension will make a big difference for you. If you drive a vehicle with an automatic gearbox I definitely would recommend to install a secondary transmission cooler as sand driving in general is very taxing on the transmission. If you drive an automatic in sand, I would recommend driving it in manual mode most of the time so that the transmission doesn't go gear hunting, which increases the heat in the transmission. So guys, let me quickly go through the basic recovery equipment you may or may not want to have uh, when you do any sand driving. Traction boards, Max Trex, or these are the ARB Thread Pro. I don't know, to be honest, I have them for a while. I've never used them. I only carry them if I do remote desert exploration, uh, where we're far away from any civilization. I think it's a fairly overrated piece of equipment. However, it can be useful. I would say have a set of uh, uh, Thread Pros or Max Trex if you travel by yourself, if you have a trailer and if you are not very experienced then it's probably not a bad thing to have them with you. Keep in mind uh, when you use them you don't want to spin your wheels on them, you rip these things out fairly quickly so um, you need to have the right technique to actually recover with them. What I definitely would have is a few of the soft shackles. Keep in mind if you use soft shackles uh, you will need to make sure that all your anchor points and so on are soft and round. You can't have soft shackles on sharp edges because it's Dyneema rope. I also have a winch on my vehicle. While it's not necessarily, it's definitely my preferred uh, recovery method because I have the most control over it and it is the safest. I definitely want to have a bridle or equalizer, uh, also called tree trunk protector. I'm going to have a snatch strap for gentle uh, snatch recoveries. While I won't be going into recoveries in this video, um, a sand recovery, a sand snatch recovery in 99% of cases should be a very gentle recovery and doesn't need that much kinetic force. 
unless uh, you already did the wrong thing, you dug yourself in or you got yourself stuck on the water's edge or in the water. Most important piece of equipment to have any sand driving and desert driving is a shovel. I have a bush ranger shovel here. Haven't used it much though because I also have a small shovel. So I have a few winch or snatch blankets with you. To be honest, the most important thing with any snatch uh, or winch recovery is the safety distance that no one is in the line of fire um, because tests have shown that these don't do too much. However, I still have them on there and uh, for snatch recovery I would use two in the most cases. Make sure you don't have the ones which are cut out here. Um, that really defeats the purpose because you would like to have this part over the metal. Very important compressor and something to air down and air up. Um, you could use a simple stick to air down. Um, actually, I still use stick that method. Often. I have a JMAC PEM for airing up. It's going a bit overboard, but I absolutely love it. I'm using it now for a year and I hook that up to my compressor, which I can't show you because the compressor is in the vehicle fixed mounted. And then I just set the desired pressure click the button, it will automatically air up to the PSI I set, will start beeping and stop. And I found that the fastest way to inflate your tire by far. My 35 inch tire I inflate uh, from around 15 PSI back to 40, 42 PSI in uh, under three minutes. Uh, that is pretty fast. That's with a dual ARB compressor or with my twin AOB compressors in the Jeep. You also want to have a snatch strap which has the correct recovery load limit for your vehicle. That's around two to three times the weight of your vehicle. So if your vehicle is uh, three ton, you want to have a seven to nine ton snatch strap. You definitely don't want to go heavier because that means it becomes kind of a uh, tow rope and you don't have the flex and that cause damage. I won't be discussing uh, sand recovery in this video. I will leave that for a different video. But if you adhere to my tips uh, in this video, you shouldn't really need recovery. With my vehicle and the way I drive, I've never needed a recovery so far. I know I'm probably gonna jinx me now and the next video you will see me stuck and need to be recovered. But on sand, I've never been stuck. So if you drive a bit sensible, if you have the correct tire pressure, really no need to get stuck in sand. Regardless of your setup, tire size, the most important thing for driving in sand is still tire pressure. I mean, these has been flogged over and over in social media, but I'm still surprised how many people we do encounter which have inadequate tire pressure to provide the elongated footprint required for sand driving. It is hard to give you universal advice which tire pressure to run, as it depends on a few factors like the weight of the vehicle, the rim size, the tire size, the tire brand and type, and the terrain. But a good guideline is that you can air down as low as your rim size. So for instance, if you have a 17 inch rim, you can air down to 17 psi. If you have a 20 inch rim, you air down to 20 psi. This is not perfect, but a very good starting point from where you can adjust up or down as required. Lower tire pressures provide us a longer elongated footprint, which means more contact area with the ground and therefore more traction. It also marginally increases the width of the tire and allows more of the thread to have contact with the ground. It also provides additional dampening and works together with our suspension to have a smoother ride and more comfort. Lower tire pressure helps the tire to mold around obstacles or sticks and therefore reduces the chance of a puncture or tire damage. Low tire pressure means more traction and therefore less wheel spin, which also helps to protect our tracks. If you run very low tire pressure, there obviously is the risk of running the tire off the beat. However, in six years of driving, this has never occurred to me. So here are a few things you should consider when running low pressure. You should avoid extreme braking in sand. In most cases in sand, you won't need the brakes. Just take your foot off the accelerator and the car will come to a standstill fairly quickly. 
you should also avoid extreme steering maneuvers, especially at higher speed, as that can push the tire off the beat. Another possible issue you could run into running very low pressure is that the tire spins on the rim. However, if you drive considerate and take the tire pressure you run into account, this has never been an issue for me in all of my sand driving trips. On rocky terrain, you could pinch the sidewall if your tire pressure is too low. An easy way to find out whether your pressure is too low is to place one of your wheels, ideally your rear wheel, on top of a rock and ensure that you still have enough sidewall between the outer edge of the rim and the edge of the tire. I definitely lower my tire pressure on gravel roads and I usually sit anywhere between 20 and 30 psi depending on the road. If gravel is followed by a short patch of tar, I don't change my tire pressure. I keep my speed low between 60 and 80 km per hour and make sure that my tires don't overheat. If I stay on tar for more than a few kilometers, I definitely air back up to road pressure. Keep in mind, if your tire pressure is too low on the road, it means poor steering and braking, uneven tire wear, much higher chance for a tire failure and excessive heat build up, especially if you drive faster. If you have a manual center diff lock, make sure you disengage it when you hit tar. My on-road pressure is around 45 psi warm. On higher speed tracks like the Tenemai road, which you see here, I go down to around 28 psi. A good starting point for high speed corrugation would be to lower your tire pressure between 20 to 40 percent from your on-road pressure. I usually start at around 28 psi on gravel roads and then work my way down or up. Especially if you drive at higher speed, you will need to keep an eye on your tire temperature. If you have a tire pressure monitor, they often also check the tire temperature, so that's a good start. Otherwise, jump out of the vehicle after 10 to 15 minutes of driving and touch the tires. If the tires are too hot, and I would say anything about 65 degrees would be too hot, then you either need to slow down or air up. How fast should I drive over corrugation? That's often a highly discussed topic. You usually have two different camps. One camp will say you need to drive slow over corrugation and one camp will say you need to drive fast over corrugation. Personally, I have been in both camps because I have driven corrugation with a variety of vehicles and different suspension setups. So my personal experience is that people with inadequate suspension or not a very good suspension setup will usually say you need to drive them slow. On my last trip over the Canning Stock Route and Tenemai, where we had nearly 2,500 kilometers of corrugation and I had a very good suspension setup, I did a bit of unscientific testing and using the vibration of my GoPro mount mounted on the bull bar to determine how much vibration the vehicle has at slow and fast speed. Let's have a look at that. Again, that is the corrugation slow speed. You see that camera? Uh, yeah, it's about to rip off. That's uh, 40 kilometers, a bit over 40. Now we're going to speed up. And you see how that quietens down. So speed is certainly a friend of corrugation if you have a suspension to support that. Some people say if you drive faster, you will skip over the corrugation and miss the valleys, which is not correct. You still drive through the valleys, but because your speed is higher, you stay less time in that valleys and the suspension um, works faster, but with less travel. And that seems to keep the vehicle uh, more steady and keep the vibration down. So from my experience, over corrugation, faster is better anywhere between say 70 and 90 kilometers but obviously you need to take the conditions into account if you have winding roads if you have speed limits you cannot drive that fast but in general faster speed with a good suspension setup um, will give you a much better ride and i reckon is also less taxing on the vehicle than slow speed if you drive fast on outback roads, for example on the Tenemai, which is a straight line, we drove up to 90, 100 km per hour. If you encounter oncoming traffic, be it a road train or a normal vehicle, it is highly advisable to pull over as far as possible to the left, slow down and hope that the oncoming vehicle gives you the same courtesy. 
These will prevent stones from flying everywhere and make it a much safer passing for both vehicles. The second prerequisite for uh, successful sand driving and also quite underrated in my opinion is throttle control. Without good throttle control uh, you will struggle in sand, you will dig yourself in where you can't extract yourself. So let me explain a little bit about throttle control. Throttle control is the second most important thing to consider when going off-road driving. Especially when driving in sand, good throttle control is vital, as it will allow you to keep enough momentum to keep you going, but not so much uh, momentum that you spin tires and throw rooster tails. This drive from Steve demonstrates quite well how even a quick lapse in throttle control can get you stuck. But you notice as soon as his forward momentum is stopped, he right away takes his foot off the pedal and doesn't dig himself in. That means he can easily reverse back out and does not need any recovery. A good way to practice your throttle control is to find a dune and try to drive it up as slow as possible but without losing momentum. If your forward momentum gets stopped, that means you weren't in the optimum rev range. Reverse back out and try that again until you find the slowest possible speed you can drive up that dune. As more as you practice this, as better your throttle control will become. Try to keep your vehicle in the optimum rev range. For me that is around 2300 to 2500 rpm. That means if the sand becomes too soft I have a good reserve and can put the foot down. Let me quickly discuss electronic traction aids. That's not really an issue for myself and one of the reasons why I purchased the Land Cruiser because it has very limited electronics and it doesn't have traction control or electronic stability control. While electronic stability control makes your vehicle far safer on the road, for off-road and especially for sand driving it is not really desirable. A lot of people also seem to confuse electronic stability control and traction control. While they both use the ABS system, they have two very different functions. Electronic stability control, in short ESC, also referred to as ESP or DCS, and it uses your lateral acceleration and steering wheel sensors to prevent over or understeer. When it detects events, it will break individual wheels, but also throttle the engine output, and that is obviously something, especially in sand driving, you do not want. Traction control uses the ABS speed sensors to detect wheel slip and then breaks that particular wheel and therefore provides drive to the opposite wheel. It is pretty much a poor man's diff lock. For sand driving, DCS should definitely be disabled and traction control should also be disabled unless you ascend dunes with cross axle Humpty Doos. My Jeep play truck for example has electronic stability control and let me show you quickly how that is automatically disabled if I go into low range. This is the regular instrument cluster and I'm now going into low range and as soon as I switch into low range you see the ESC off and you also see on the display ESC off. This may look different on your vehicle so again consult your owner's manual and that should tell you how to disable it and how you can see that on your display. With my vehicle and setup, I can comfortably do a whole desert crossing in high range, and I have done so in the past. However, high range means you put a lot more stress on your drive line and on your gearbox and transfer case. So I started switching far more often to low range, especially if the sand is very soft or I ascend or descend steep dunes, mainly to protect my gearbox, transfer case and drive line. Diff locks are really required when sand driving. However, on very steep dunes with some cross axle Humpty Doos, the diff locks may become handy. Also, if you can't get up a particular dune and uh, really struggle, it probably doesn't harm to put the diff locks in. I can count on one hand how often I engage my diff locks during sand driving or desert driving. For everything but sand driving, diff locks are essential in my eyes, as they only really make a proper four-wheel drive. If you're interested in the different type of diff locks, don't miss my video where I compare a Harrop Eaton E-Locker, ARB Air Locker and a TJM Pro Locker. 
I have driven manual vehicles for the first 20 years of my driving life and my second touring vehicle, the Land Rover Defender, also was a manual vehicle and I have did a few desert crossings with that vehicle. Nowadays I definitely prefer an automatic and I chose a Land Cruiser because it had that A750 5 speed automatic. A lot of people think with an automatic you don't have engine braking when you go downhill but um, that's actually not the case if you put it into manual mode. The engine braking is nearly equivalent to the manual. An auto gives you far better control and more options. You also have less issues if you need to reverse in water or in mud. So it's a personal choice, but for me, auto all the way. Okay, let's talk about tire construction. In an ideal world, we have one specific tire for each terrain we drive. We have a dedicated tire for only sand, we have a dedicated tire for only rock, we have a dedicated tire for um, mud and, and very slushy or snow terrain. But in reality, that's impossible because if we travel in Australia, we can encounter pretty much any terrain, sometimes on the same day, if you're in Tasmania, for example. So we need to find a tire construction which uh, serves us the best in the widest selection of terrain. And for me, that clearly is a mud terrain tire. Because a mud terrain tire works pretty well in sand. It works, in my opinion, as well as an all-terrain tire or a road tire. It works very well on gravel roads. It is not perfect on-road, but that is not the most important part for me. And on-road behavior on a new modern mud terrain tire is pretty good actually. I, I really won't complain too much there. However, a mud terrain tire also performs very well in mud. And that is where any other tire construction will let you down. An all-terrain tire does not perform well in mud and a road tire obviously doesn't perform at all. So to cover the widest selection of uh, track conditions, a mud terrain tire is for me my all-round touring tire. Traction is really only one part of the picture though, because the best traction doesn't really help me if I have a tire failure somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And given that I do a lot of remote touring, that means I'm sometimes three, four, five days from civilization, from the next uh, definable trek even. So for me, um, strength and tire reliability is as important as traction. A good mud terrain tire is definitely the strongest tire you can purchase. It has a way stronger sidewall than, for example, an AT tire, and you don't even want to compare it with a road tire. So it's really important to have a balance between traction and strength, and that is clearly a mud terrain tire for me. A mud terrain tire has a deeper thread pattern, so there is more rubber between you and any obstacle or stick. It has very aggressive side biters, which I had actually sticks and branches pinch, which otherwise may have entered the carcass. A mud terrain tire has a much stronger sidewall than an AT tire or a road tire. So strength-wise, you really can't beat a mud terrain tire. So for me, based on six years of experience uh, of driving in desert country, in sand country, uh, doing driver training uh, in sand, my experience is a good mud terrain tire performs as well in sand as an AT or road tire. However, strength-wise, I have seen very few um, mud terrain tires being punctured or failed in remote areas. However, I have seen plenty of AT tires having punctures and in some of our trips they, they went through three tires in three days. Uh, that is on ATs. So based on my experience, mud terrain tire all the way for me as the best overall tire if you do a lot of remote touring. Personally, I'm a big fan of BFG tires. I have run the BFG KM2s for many years and probably all up 10 sets of them. I never had a tire failure. They serve me very well in every terrain. I now run the BFG KM3s and I'm on the third set. After testing the BFG KM3s for one set, I decided to take up an offer from BFG to become one of the ambassadors and uh, therefore they provide me tires for my vehicle 
and um, yeah, I, I really can't fault them. I know tires is a personal choice, but for me, BFG never have let me down. And they provide for me the perfect combination of a touring tire. They work very well in mud. They are pretty quiet on the road. I get good mileage out of them. And I also use them on my play truck uh, for rock crawling. And I really can't fault them. If you have a good set of LT all-terrain tires and you're planning a Simpson Desert trip, I would not say that you need to change them. Um, use them, that's perfectly fine. Just be aware where you drive a little bit. If you have road tires and you would like to do a desert crossing, I certainly would not have advised that. Road tires are really only for the road. If you have a set of good mud terrain tires and you would like to do a desert crossing, perfect. Leave them on there, no issue whatsoever. Just adjust the tire pressure accordingly for the tire you are driving. A mud terrain tire, stiffer sidewall, usually a bit lower pressure, an 80 tire, less stiff sidewall, so you run the pressure a little bit higher. There are pretty much three main ways how we can increase traction. Number one is by increasing the contact patch, which we achieve by airing down, but which we will also achieve by having wider tires. Number two is increasing uh, the pressure per square inch. That would be actually the opposite of wider tires. It means we would have narrower tires. The third uh, method would be the tire compound. So softer tires obviously have on dry ground and flat ground more grip than harder tires. So these are the three main ways really how we can increase traction. However, in my opinion, the area which really concerns us the most is creating a larger contact patch. Um, why is that so? Number one, increasing the, the square inch uh, pressure per contact, I don't think that is really a practical area for four-wheel driving. Um, I see very few situations where that would be of benefit. For example, if you have a very slushy mud uh, puddle, but you have a firm ground underneath, so a narrow tire would make it easier to get through that slush to the hard bottom on the ground. Um, yes, 100%. Uh, similar if you would do snow driving on a road or on hard ground and you have a chance to penetrate the snow uh, deep enough to get actually to some ground which provides traction. That are really the only two ways where I would say a narrow tire is more beneficial. However, in sand driving, and obviously this video is mainly about sand driving, uh, but that also would apply to rock crawling, a wider, longer contact patch is really what we want because um, there is hardly any sandy terrain where you just have a you know, shallow amount of sand and underneath you have a hard ground. If you do desert driving, if you do beach driving, that is usually sand for several meters, if not longer. So you can't really break through there and, and reach hard ground. So in my opinion, really a wider footprint and a longer footprint, so more contact area, uh, means better flotation and much better for sand driving. One thing mentioned as a disadvantage sometimes for wider tires is the higher roading resistance. And yes, while that is correct, they have a higher roading resistance and that means you have a bit higher fuel consumption and a little bit more wear on your parts, especially if you don't do the other required modifications to your vehicle. Uh, in my opinion, it has absolutely no bearing on traction. I mean, just by airing down, we automatically increase the rolling resistance. And the supposed sand build up in front of the tire, uh, which then makes it more difficult to drive in sand. Yeah, I, I cannot concur to that at all. Um, that may apply if you have an absolutely grossly underpowered vehicle or have not re-geared with an upgrade in diameter. From my experience, the rolling resistance has little to do with traction and the flotation on sand. I think anyone who fits extra narrow tires and then thinks he has a better traction in sand is really missing the point. I think narrow tires really it's a personal choice in regards of looks. If you like the look of narrow tires, um, that's perfectly fine. But in my opinion, they certainly don't work better in sand. So when I look for tires, do I go out and look for an extra wide tire? 
No, definitely not. Um, I chose pretty much the combination which is most popular and the easiest available uh, in the widest range of brands. So for me, my Cam 3s are 315, 75, 16. And uh, if for whatever reason the Cam 3 wouldn't be in the country, I would have no difficulties um, resourcing another brand tire with the same dimension. And that really is the main factor for me. A little bit narrower, a little bit wider, honestly can be all compensated with tire pressure, will not make any big difference in my book. The different tire compounds I will also leave out of the equation because again for sand driving I don't really think it makes too much difference. It's different for rock crawling, um, so there a softer compound for example on rocks definitely provides much better grip. But uh, the second issue why I neglect that a little bit is that hardly any tire manufacturer, uh, unless you really buy uh, competition tires, will not disclose their compound. There is no rating system for the different hardness. So it will be very difficult to really come to a, a good common denominator and compare different tires. Yeah, unless, unless you buy a sticky trapdoor or you purchase a blue label BFG crawler, um, they are known and, and advertised as a very soft compound, but they're all not road legal. So I don't really take that into account because of that. Let me stress one thing. I give you here my ideal setup and what works best. Does that mean you can't do beach driving on small tires and you will need 35 inch tires? No, absolutely not. You certainly can and it has been done before and it will be done after me. I'm just discussing what I found are the best setups for sand driving. Let's talk about uh, tire sizes. In my opinion, the second best modification you can make to increase the off-road capabilities of your vehicle are the largest possible tires you can run on your vehicle. Let me first start with the benefits of running larger diameter tires. Only larger tires, except from portal axles, will increase your diff clearance. And diff clearance is always a major factor in four-wheel driving. Larger tires, together with the required lift, will also improve your approach angle, your ramp over angle and your departure angle. Larger tires will also make obstacles much smaller. An obstacle which you have difficulties to conquer with a 31-inch tire will be much easier with a 35-inch tire. With larger tires you also need a different suspension setup and that means you usually have more suspension travel. And um, all four wheels on the ground means traction. So bigger suspension travel usually means better traction. Another benefit of running bigger tires is that you have more rubber and more air and that gives you more options to air down. You can run lower pressure on bigger tires than you can run on smaller tires. So what are the cons of larger tires? First of all, to set up a vehicle correctly with big tires takes a bit of thought and it is expensive because you need the required engineering, you usually need to re-gear your divs, you may need different drive shafts, you will need a lift and a suspension setup, you may have to make some modifications to your guards, you may need wider flares, so it's certainly not for everyone. The disadvantages of uh, bigger tires are more rolling resistance, However, if you re-gear your diffs, that is not really much of an issue. When I changed from 33-inch tires to 35-inch tires, I did notice a huge increase in fuel. It was really negligible. To set up your vehicle correctly, and that is imperative with bigger tires, yeah, doing all the required modifications, including re-gearing the diffs, that is not a cheap exercise. You will also need your vehicle engineered if you go more than two tire sizes up. The on-road behavior with bigger tires is slightly worse than with smaller tires because you have more sidewall. So overall, if done correctly, running bigger tires is the second best modification for off-road capability you can do on your four-wheel drive. Let's discuss rim sizes. On my Land Cruiser I have 16-inch rims with 35-inch tires which gives me a pretty good amount of sidewall. Sidewall is good because it gives you more option to air down, you can achieve a bigger footprint. 
However, if you have more sidewall, the on-road behavior is slightly diminished because you have more sidewall flex when you go around corners and so on. So I find a 16 inch rim for a 35 inch tire um, works very well. On my Jeep, on the play truck, I have 37 inch tires and I have a 17 inch rim. If you do more on-road than off-road driving and you want to run a 35 inch tire, I would recommend a 17 inch rim because it just makes on-road behavior and cornering a bit better. If you have a vehicle with 18 inch and up rim size, it really shows that it is more uh, developed for on-road driving, not for off-road driving. Usually you have big rim sizes to accommodate big brake calipers, but sometimes you can get aftermarket wheels which are a bit smaller and I certainly would recommend that if you intend to do a lot of um, off-road driving. If you have a big rim size, 19, 20 inch or even bigger, it means you have very little sidewall and can't really achieve the footprint uh, you would like to achieve. And it also means you run a much higher risk of pinching your sidewall when you air down. So you are really limited how much you can air down. So guys, that was the first part of my sand driving video. I hope you got some useful information out of it. Please keep in mind, all my videos are self-funded. There is no big sponsor behind it. So please help me um, to share, like, subscribe. And if you can afford, maybe even head over to Patreon where you get access a few days earlier to my videos and you can help me with a small monthly contribution making that videos. If you're already my Patreon supporter, I thank you very, very much because really you guys help me to make this happening and continue to produce these videos. Don't forget part two of the sand driving series is out soon where I will give specific sand driving tips for beach and desert driving. So watch out for that.